Principle of Macroeconomics, Chapter 9, Inflation, Professor Wagner. This chapter, we're going to speak about how we track uh, inflation, how to measure the changes in cost of living, and how we can compare our country versus other countries with, with inflation, what the confusion over inflation typically is uh, dealing with the public, indexing and its limitations. Uh, sometimes a lot of people will talk about the value of you know, inflation in terms of value, in, in valuation of the currency. So we have uh, in Zimbabwe, we have a hundred billion dollar note and even have some of a hundred trillion. So effectively they're worthless. This is not really the only illustration of this type of uh, hyperinflation that uh, Zimbabwe experienced uh, after World War I. Uh, when Germany lost the war, they were forced to make uh, reparations via the Versailles Treaty. And that amounted to an astronomical sum of money. So one of the tactics the Germans used was hyperinflating their currency to make it nearly worthless. And so the, the German mark was, you know, very similar. You would pay for a loaf of bread with a million marks. And so this effectively hyperinflating their economy. But that did have a negative impact on the uh, population because people went hungry. They couldn't, you know, get the goods that they needed to get by very often. So it was a rather painful period. Certainly, I'm sure things are painful in Zimbabwe if they're still doing this. Inflation, well, there's a general, an ongoing rise in prices in the entire economy. That's just a matter of, you know, a change in rate. Uh, there are, is a pressure in most, you know, for prices to rise in most markets in the economy, especially when it's growing. And so we have this thing we call a hypothetical basket of goods. And sometimes, uh, there is a lot of debate about what's actually in this bag of goods because some people notice that certain goods inflate a great deal more with respect to what the economists tend to put in the basket or what the government uses for uh, statistics. So that's something to consider. It's used to calculate the price level by looking at how those particular items change over time. And that's computed using a weighted average. So it's, you know, you notice it says typical set of consumer purchases. It sometimes never represents gas. It very often doesn't represent the cost of meat um, and other things that tend to uh, inflate at a rate different than everything else around it. So, you know, this basket of goods idea certainly is a fun thing to talk about and often debated. So, Inflation is often tracked with an index number, and it's really a unit-free type of thing. We'll just say we speak in term of, terms of, let's say, $1,967, and we're going to go ahead and say that uh, that's our baseline and the, uh, the index value of what, uh, you know, of what you could buy in 1967 uh, would be deemed 100, and so... As time goes on, you can take a look at the change of calculations, the level in the new year minus the level in the prior year, divided by the level in the prior year, that's the percentage change, and that end index will climb over a period of time. So that's how they calculate it. You might want to know that for the test. Right here, it's not very difficult. Here we have a, you know, how to measure changes in the cost of living. Okay, there's a consumer price index. That's something you're going to want to know. It's uh, basically the change in fixed basket of goods and services versus a change in cost of living. So basically those are the two things that are being compared. So probably know what that is. Substitution bias, uh, the inflation rate using a fixed basket of goods over time tends to overstate the true rise in the cost of living because it doesn't take into account the person can substitute away from goods whose prices rise considerably. So yes, substitution uh, can uh, skew that quite a bit. Quality of new goods bias, inflation cost by the same uh, basket of goods tends to overstate the true rise of cost of living because it doesn't account for improvements of the quality of existing goods or the invention of new goods to take their place. 
So thereby saying whatever's in the basket may be in fact obsolescent or no longer relevant. The weighting of CPI components, and you can see a sample pie here. And housing you know, usually comprises a certain percentage of you know, normal people's income, food and beverage. And so this would be considered your basket of goods. And so the categories, you know, these are the eight categories to uh, generate a consumer price index. And you notice the housing is the highest and you, you know, you work your way down. Okay, uh, core inflation index takes the CPI and excludes volatile variables like energy and food prices. So I mentioned that earlier, and that's why you will see you know, why you will see that that fluctuates you know, up and down a great deal more. However, it still you know it still does you know impact the cost of living. But uh, the economists believe that you know it's a better gauge to you know we'll say part these out. You know, to you know, make policy you know policy changes based on you know goods that have less volatility. Practical solutions for substitution, you know, and uh, new goods bias is to allow substitution between the goods, and so sometimes that will create uh, alternate CPIs based on those substitutions. Updates to the you know, basket of goods more frequently can also be a better indicator, improve the indicator. Substitution bias you know, has always been somewhat reduced. You know, so basically you take that out of the picture and you probably have a little bit more realistic snapshot. The rise in CPI usually overstates the true rise in inflation by only half a percent per year. So it's really not a lot of variance involved here. Other cool terms you'll probably want to know for the test. PPI, you know, that's the producer price index. So that's the cost of, you know, it's cost of uh, processing, the cost of the commodities, all the inputs that create need, needed to create a good. You have the international price index is essentially the buying power from one country to another. You could also say it's the uh, currency exchange rate and the relative cost of goods in either country. Employment cost index, so uh, it's a measure of inflation based on wages. And the GP, GDP deflator is based on the prices of all GDP components. So, and there are, you know, consumption, investment, government, exports minus imports. That's a nice little formula. You may see that again. Uh, the U.S. certainly has seen uh, some interesting uh, Inflate, you know, periods of inflation. These typically happen after wars. So World War One, we saw a bit of hyperinflation. Uh, after World War Two, the same. But we also saw a tremendous amount of uh, industrial and commercial growth during these periods as well. 1970s, a little bit the same thing, but some weird things happened in the 70s that didn't happen before. And that is that uh, during the 1970s, we had hyperinflation, we had high unemployment, and we had uh, gas shortages, which were interesting variables that were in the mix that caused, you know, things to be kind of haywire. Deflation is negative inflation. So that's when prices in the economy are falling. Uh, notable periods of deflation. So that's, you know, after a period of, of recession, typically. So between 1920 and 21, uh, certainly uh, the depression of the 1930s. Uh, once again, the defined term of hyperinflation, it's a high outburst of high inflation that occurs when economies shift from a controlled economy to a market. So you can see that the uh, US price level and inflation rates. And so once again, you have to take a look at where, you know, that mark here, and if you draw a straight line, it's probably somewhere around 1979 or 77, where the price level or the index level is 100. And of course, you know everything is compared to you know you know compared to the buying power of 1979. And so here, 1913, it was really quite low. It's about you know 10 to 1 difference you know between that time and that time. 
and from 100 to 250 in present day terms. So our index went up 150 points in that time from 1979 to present, which yeah, stands to reason if you take a look at what you could do in 1979 in terms of buying a house here in Texas, uh, very often you could find things between forty and seventy thousand dollars that were quite reasonable. I mean, I'm talking about average people's homes, fifteen hundred square feet, three two twos, that sort of thing. But you know, you know what I call intermediate term uh, family homes, decent homes. Uh, that those same homes, if you try to buy them today, they're well over two hundred thousand dollars. So that's an example of how the price index can uh, change you know, within a period of time. At the same time, you'll notice during the same time, we, we've had periods of inflation and even periods of deflation, two of those, one after World War I and one during the Great Depression. And then we have a couple troughs here somewhere, you know, beginning, you know, the idea that we might be going to war somewhere in 39 and certainly in 49. So we did have zero inflation. Most economists really don't like zero deflation. It means that there, that means no growth. Uh, deflation is certainly negative growth, and that would be also reflected in the GDP numbers as well. So this is a chart of how inflation rates are compared against each other, all heavily industrialized first rate uh, you know, mature developed nations, US, Japan, Germany, the UK. And you can kind of see that uh, the US's inflation is, you know, relatively flat with respect to Japan or the UK. And certainly we've had spikes, but basically, you know, we, we weren't as volatile as others during the 70s. Yeah, we were impacted, but not quite as bad. Uh, the, per, the people that seem to have one of the best curves here is Germany, but they, you know, they have had a couple periods where their inflation was probably too low or even deflationary. Okay, uh, these charts show inflation rates, Brazil, China, and Russia. And you can also throw India in there. Uh, if you were in the stock market, you know, certainly about 10 years ago, or you may have heard the term BRIC, you know, countries, well, that stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and uh, they were very hot economies for quite some time, and there was a lot of money to be made, but their inflation rates were also through the roof, too. Uh, sometimes the inflation rate, you know, per, per year could go anywhere from 50 to 100%. So they were in a constant state of hyperinflation, the currency not being worth very much. And uh, so it made them less desirable to uh, invest in unless there was some kind of uh, parallel economy inside the country based on the US dollar or some other stable currency where you could buy or sell goods you know, on that basis. And, uh, trade was possible doing that, but uh, generally speaking, uh, these this is a very uh, frequent situation in these countries. Uh, economic variables, you know, such as price, wage, or interest rates, they don't necessarily move along with inflation. They only they only adjust after a time lag, and that's part of the stickiness thing again, uh, where we can say that price, wages, and interest rates are sticky, doesn't necessarily move with inflation in sync. Uh, then inflation can cause three types of problems, and that will be the unintended redistribution of purchasing power, blurred price signals, a difficulty in long-term planning, so it creates a bit of uh, confusion and fear and interferes with uh, businesses wanting to make future investment and in production. So unintended re redistributions of purchasing power. So people are hurt by inflation when they are holding cash. So people are fearful and they put it, on, put it in a mattress or someplace safe. 
and they're just not really spending. They have uh, financial asset investments, but a nominal return doesn't keep up with inflation. So let's say we have a 2% inflation rate and you put your money in money market where you get maybe a quarter percent interest. Well, you're losing money uh, over time because you're, you're the growth of your you know, cash inside that money market fund is lagging by 1.75%. So you're losing that much every year should everything just stay the same. So that's not necessary. And, and also taxes could be a factor. So, um, you know, if they change the tax laws and make them unfavorable for, let's say, capital gains or other things that people do, uh, that will also impact them. Uh, wages will sometimes lag behind inflation, very often does, very sticky. And so sometimes they'll adjust it once or twice a year, but we've recently come through a period where we had absolutely no wage growth for about 10 years. And a lot of people can really look, you know, reflect back on that and realize that was the case. Um, a retiree receiving a private company defined pension, uh, you know, I think that's okay. I mean, I'm not against these. If you got them, keep them. They're good things. Uh, all, almost every company even has one of these, still has a 401k, and you can put money in it. It's just, you know, anytime I see the word defined benefit pension, I consider that to be a good thing because that's a constant. It's a different basket of money that is operating from, differently from, let's say, everything else is going on. And so if going back to wages and inflation, uh, this curve, these, this pair of curves shows a relative buying power and with respect to the time of the minimum wage. So the buying power you know, dropped more than 37, 30% from 67 to 2000, 2010, because of the nominal figure, $1.40 to 725 an hour. So effectively there's the real, the real amount of money, the real amount of minimum wage with respect to the nominal, the nominal, the nominal. So effectively the buying power of the minimum wage. It increases in uh, increases in the minimum wage in 20, 2008 and 2010 kept things from being worse. But this is what people were talking about was the buying power of their money at any given point in time. Uh, because of price stickiness in you know with uh, fluctuations and with inflation, uh, very often because of the stickiness, or it blurs the price messaging. It also, you know, makes things a little bit more uncertain. People really don't know exactly how to react to the signals, economic signals, whether they should produce more or less. And so this just, you know, it's like static on radio, as the slide says. It's just a perception thing, but you know it creates uncertainty and certainly a bit of fear, which really is a deterrent to an economy growing. Yeah. Examples of what long term, how long term planning can be difficult uh, on an individual level. We have planning for retirement and unknown future dollar levels. So, you know, let's say maybe being a millionaire in 1980 is a lot different than being a millionaire let's say in present, you know, in the present day, that's about a 30, you know, 30, well, let's say 40 year spread there. And so the buying power is a lot different. And so the typical millionaire, you, he might be very difficult to identify. He could be a 401k millionaire. He could be living in a relatively, what used to be considered a middle-class neighborhood. However, the guy's got a net worth and, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of debt. And typically a guy like this will drive, you know, what we consider a mid-level sedan like a Camry or an Accord or a Fusion or something like that. Nothing too flashy. And you just never would know. And, uh, but it does, you know, planning for retirement, you know, is an unknown. A lot of people are, I would say probably most of America is really uh, completely unprepared for retirement. And I think that's going to be a big problem. 
not just for boomers, but I think really the generations following because they haven't had the advantage of having uh, defined benefit plans as part of their retirement package. So there is a comparison of inflation rate against labor productivity from 60 to 2014. And you can see that you know, inflation rate is real high here in the 70s. Productivity is pretty low, uh, certainly below zero. That's not really uh, too hot. And so over the last several decades, when rising inflation rates have been closely followed by low, lower productivity, lower inflation rates have corresponded to uh, increasing productivity rates. So there, it's not always this way, but there does seem to be an in, inverse relationship. A couple terms you may see on the test, but these are everyday household terms, cost of living adjustments, and that's basically a, uh, a how people, you know, raises given just to keep your, you know, wages static with inflation. They always lag inflation, no matter who you work for. Uh, typically, adjustable rate mortgages, you know, are indexing arrangements where, okay, if uh, interest rates are gut low, you know, you could take advantage of that for a period of time and then maybe lock it in later. Uh, they tend to be lower than uh, fixed rates, and so that's what makes them attractive, but they're risky. Uh, indexing and government programs, so sometimes the uh, tax code will, you know, do something to where higher tax rates are indexed or rise automatically with inflation. Benefits can increase along with it. Uh, but once again, uh, certainly the level of Social Security benefits uh, you know, still manages to lag the uh, actual inflation rate, even if they're using the CPI. Uh, U.S. government offers index bonds promising to pay a certain real interest rate above whatever inflation rate occurs, and those are called tips. Those are pretty. Those are pretty interesting. Uh, you know, bonds that people can buy. We could talk about a little bit more about bonds later on in the course, and this closes out. Chapter 9.